Let's see, now it's recording. Okay, so uh, hi John, I am uh, glad to see you. Um, um, I will begin by introducing you, okay, before um, conducting uh, this interview, which uh, we will uh, transcribe and, and uh, publish in, um, in Open Democracy. Okay, so uh, John Judis, we met in Madrid um, a few years ago when he came uh, to present his book, uh, The Populist Explosion, which has been a bestseller, it has been highly praised. And since then he has um, um, finished a, a trilogy. Yeah? Um, uh, his most recent book is The Socialist Awakening, what's different, about, uh, what's different now about the left. And previously he published The Nationalist Revival, Trade, Immigration and the Revolt Against Globalization. Um, his editor at large at uh, Talking Points Memo, um, he has also um, um, written for numerous publications, including the New York Times Magazine, Mother Jones, the Washington Post. Um, let me do a little bit of history, because I think it's, um, it's important to note that in 1969, 1969 you, you were a founding editor of Socialist Re Revolution, which was later renamed Socialist Review and then Radical Society. And you've also been a senior editor of the New Republic and senior writer for the National um, Journal. Um, I would like to read some of the short reviews that, um, that your books have received on, um, uh, by um, magazines and newspapers in different sides of the political spectrum. Um, for example, the BBC said that if you read no other political book this year, read The Populist Explosion by John Judis, which brilliantly sets out the connection to, pres to present circumstances. Um, we also have um, uh, the New York Times Review of Books, which said in November 2016, but it could be also applied uh, to, to this November, the fate of the Republic will turn on one question. How popular is the populism of Donald Trump? The populist explosion is a cogent and exceptionally clarifying guide to a political phenomenon that is at once elusive and, yes, explosive. And I would also like to, uh, to read uh, another um, review by the American Conservative, um, which argues that you are a rare left of center journalist who takes our populist nationalist movement seriously. Rather than dismiss the leaders and constituencies of the American and European movements as mere, as mere, mere xenophobes, um, John Judis offers an empathetic balls and strikes analysis of the socioeconomic factors that made, that made and continue to make such campaigns viable. I find this very important because it's a matter of understanding, of uh, understanding why people vote in such a way instead of just attacking them as alienated people or uh, of course they have um, some some reasons and i think your book um, um, uh, is a, a great asset to understanding why people think the way they do yeah and finally john has been um, defined as a person of the left who specializes in speaking truth to liberals yeah so i think that's um, a fantastic description um uh, so uh, again, many thanks, uh, John, for, uh, for receiving me um, uh, virtually. In this case, it would have been lovely to meet in person again, but uh, <laughs> the circumstances <laughs> um, are the circumstances, yeah. Um, so John, let me begin by focusing on your trilogy. Um, you've been writing extensively about populism, about nationalism, and socialism more uh, recently. So I would like to know your view about the role of each of these uh, movements in the electoral results a few um, days ago. We can begin with populism, for example. Well, pop, uh, you have to begin by talking. I'll talk a little about what populism is, how I understand it, and why it's been important now. Uh, populism has been a historically, starting in the 1890s in the United States, a kind of early warning signal that a consensus that's widely held among the a country's leaders 
uh, has come into disrepute and that there's a large part, part of the population which no longer believes in, let's say, in the 1890s, the promise of laissez-faire capitalism. Mm -hmm. um, more recently in the promise of a kind of neoliberalism where goods and factories could go wherever they wanted in the world and that labor could cross borders and it just wouldn't matter that uh, we'd become more and more prosperous and it hasn't panned out. And both uh, the uh, Sanders campaigns and uh, Trump's campaign in 2016 uh, were evidence of this kind of uh, populism. They were saying that um, as representatives of the people, we're saying that the establishment or the elite is out of touch. They know they're pushing policies that are getting us into trouble. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, you know, there was a lot of similarity in 2016 between what Trump and Sanders were saying, for instance, about factories that were moving overseas, about uh, Chinese mercantilism, about the fact that, they, that a lot of American companies were being put out of uh, business uh, so, uh, again, I think that there's a, there, there's a similarity, there's a left-wing and a right-wing populism. Uh, Trump is, the, uh, is really a kind of uh, exception to the rule, because usually what happens is populists uh, get uh, co-opted. The, uh, you know, the American populists of the 1890s were co-opted by the progressives and then to some extent by the New Deal itself. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you, you see that happening in Europe with um, some of the right wing populist uh, parties, let's say in Denmark, getting co op their demands on immigration and refugees getting co opted. Mm -hmm. So, usually the populist parties don't win power, they don't become the establishment. And when they do, the question is then what, what, what happens? Um, in Greece, when S Syriza became uh, the establishment, when it won power, it in effect started to act like the establishment that it had run against in the first place. It ended up making a deal with the Troika and, you know, within several years, it's now out of power and suffering very much like the old socialist party that it had, it had supplanted in the first place. So again, with Trump, the question was, what's going to happen when this guy gets into office? And, you know, it's... It's been a mixed bag. Uh, I'm not saying I'm not making a statement about favorable, unfavorable. He's kept a lot of the rhetoric of his uh, uh, 2000 campaign uh, throughout. I mean, he's again making distinctions between himself and his followers and the fake media, for instance. Uh, he's not going after uh, Wall Street in a way that he did during uh, the, the campaign. But, you know, he's been pressured companies that want to make a, a, want to go overseas. So there's some resemblance in, in terms of the rhetoric. But, you know, there are two, two other factors with Trump are important. Uh, the first is that in terms of the legislation that he passed, he really had to uh, submit to the will of the conservative Republicans, the, the business Republicans. So contrary to the kind of things he said during his campaign, his tax bill was really just tilted to business. And in fact, it uh, had incentives for companies if they wanted to move overseas and avoid taxes in the United States. So it, it was completely in uh, some way the opposite of what he was promising. Healthcare, mm -hmm. he was going to do a policy that was better than Obama, but again, in obeisance to the Tea Party Republicans in the House, he ended up just calling for its repeal uh, on a kind of uh, empty promise that it would eventually be, be replaced. So he governed in some ways as a conservative Republican. And in 2018, in, the, in our midterm elections, when we turned over the House of Representatives, that, I think that really hurt him. That was a big issue. Uh, people were worried that they would, if they had pre-existing conditions, if they had asthma, the insurance company would be able to deny them coverage. I mean, we have, as it is, a very leaky insurance company, uh, insurance system in the United States. But what Trump and the Tea Party Republicans were proposing would have been even worse. We would have been going back to before uh, Ob Obamacare. So again, in that respect, he wasn't uh, he wasn't a classic a populist. 
Uh, he was more uh, a lot of hot air, you could say. The, the other thing about Trump was that I always thought when he got to be president, uh, he would sand off the rough edges of his uh, behavior. You know, he was a TV guy and he made a lot of these kind of theatrical claims about Hillary Clinton and the lock her up and all this stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought once the guy gets in office, he'll realize he's president of the United States. He's responsible for the whole country. And he'd act, you know, like, a, like our presidents usually do, which is civil. Uh, you know, they sometimes lie, but that's not a, but only in very special circumstances or when they think it's absolutely necessary, for instance, for national security. They don't do it as a matter of practice every day on Twitter. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, again, he, he didn't change his conduct at all. Uh, my tip off that he was going to be uh, the same guy that he was during the campaign was it, even before he became president formally, before he was inaugurated in January, he made this crazy claim that five million illegal immigrants had voted for Hillary Clinton, and that's why she had won the popular vote. So that was a tip off that we were in trouble in terms of having a normal president. And I think that hurt Trump. I think that that's. Uh, th I think that that and the policies itself were very damaging to his presidency. E you know, even so, even given all those problems, um, an incumbent president has a lot of advantages. Uh, the economy was doing very well until the pandemic hit. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he did some things again that that a liberal Democrat might do, like telling the Federal Reserve that they have to have easy money, that they couldn't tighten things. He was very anti-austerity. He didn't believe in, uh, in ending deficits. He wasn't, mm -hmm. again, a classic Republican in that way. So the economy was doing pretty good. And I think if he had handled the pandemic reasonably, uh, if he had acknowledged that it existed, if he told people that they had to do things about it, and even if he wasn't entirely successful, uh, he might very well have been reelected. Re but the combination of really of his health care policy, his taxes, and, the, and his behavior as president uh, turned off too many people. So he lost, lost the election. And in that sense, um, you know, the, the uh, right-wing populism has temporarily uh, hit a roadblock in the United States. Uh, you know, again, similar in Europe, I think. I think in Germany, where the alternative for Deutschland is, has hit, hit a roadblock. So, you know, we'll have to see if Trump can revive that. But uh, it's, really, uh, it, it's really, for the moment, I uh, going to be on a, 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 a rump activist of, you know, mm -hmm. maybe 20 cent percent of the population that listen to the uh, siren song of uh, America first. Um, the other thing I'd, I'd say is that uh, in the election itself uh, between Biden and Trump, you had really two, two very different versions of American nationalism. Uh, the American left itself is, uh, has a phobia towards nationalism. They see it as, as, xeno, as xenophobic. They don't understand that in order to do things in a country, people have to feel responsible for each other. They have to feel that there's, they have something in common. And Biden ran very much al along the lines of Abraham Lincoln. We're going to unite the country. We are the United States of America. We're not red states and blue states. If I'm president, I'm going to be president of the Democrats and the Republicans. Yeah. So the soul was, of America. Yeah. Right. It was that kind of nationalism versus uh, Trump's America first, which turned out to be a uh, certain part of America first. It didn't turn out to be all, all of America first. And I think, you know, a lot of a lot of people uh, uh, saw through that. Uh, the last thing, the, the left, socialist left, I think for the moment, uh, they're going to be put in the closet because uh, what we really have with a Republican Senate and a uh, Democratic president is a kind of uh, uh, standstill gridlock that we've had uh, before during the Obama years. And the center of gravity will be somewhere sort of slightly to, off the center toward the right. 
And the kind of proposals the left has been making, uh, Medicare for all, uh, free college education, are, are just going to be off the map for the moment. Uh, 2022, 2024, they might make a comeback. But for the moment, I, I'd say that that part of the uh, American politics, the American left, is, is, has been... Uh, shelves. They've been put in a closet. So uh, that that's my sort of my summary of the uh, populism, nationalism, and socialism. Uh, many thanks. I was thinking about what you think about Joe Biden as a candidate, because he's a traditional politician of the establishment, as, and that's what uh, Donald Trump attacked uh, Joe Biden for being a, an establishment figure, which is a populist uh, strategy indeed. Uh, yeah, I know he did. And uh, I, I, again, I think if Trump had not been such a wild man mm -hmm. and, and uh, behaved himself more reputably, that, uh, th those kind of attacks might, might have stuck. But mm -hmm. I, I think a lot of people, especially in terms of the coronavirus, uh, wanted somebody in charge who was going to manage the government and just do the kind of things that a competent executive has to do. So the fact that Biden had been around and had been vice president was a plus, not a minus. I, I do not think that hurt him in the election at all. And um, since you said that uh, the socialist movements within the Democratic Party have been, um, don't have so many opportunities now of achieving their objective, which is moving uh, Joe Biden towards more progressive or more left-wing uh, policies, what should be their strategy? Thinking of a new candidate, um, because maybe Bernie Sanders um, uh, won't be the figure, the candidate in, in four years, or um, looking for younger um, um, candidates like uh, AOC. Well, we have a, a problem on the left in America, which is we almost we have skipped generations. When I used to cover um, Sanders rallies and campaign rallies, it, it was like you'd see the grandparents and their children. The grandparents would often be people mm -hmm. from the 60s, like myself, and mm -hmm. then the children would be, um, you know, 20 years old, 25 years old. Uh, between that, there's very little, and I think that that's true of the Democratic Party. Uh, the the uh, leadership on the left is primarily uh, people who are at least, let's say, under under 40. And mm -hmm. in that group yeah. of sort of 40 to, I think the youngest you could say was Sherrod Brown, who's in his late 60s. And then Elizabeth Warren is in, is in her 70s. Uh, Bernie Sanders, what, 78? So 79 now. Mm -hmm. So, so um, yeah, there's a, there is a definitely a problem of leadership. There's also a problem that the, uh, that the people like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez uh, represent very special districts in big metropolitan areas uh, where especially on social issues like whatever gender uh, transgender stuff or something like that that makes no sense in in about three-fourths of the country uh, it goes along goes on very easily in those kind of districts somebody yeah. there was a candidate in her area who ran as quote a queer, Latinx, I think it was the, she had it on her campaign literature. Mm -hmm. Now, if you put, put that in Mansfield, Ohio, or somewhere else in the exactly. heartland of America, they just wouldn't know what, what the hell they, you know, was this all about? So that, mm -hmm. the other problem, that's the other problem. I, I think, yeah. you know, one of, one of the squad is from what, they're from Seattle, uh, Detroit, uh, Palestinian, uh, combination of Palestinian and black area. Yeah. Cambridge, Massachusetts, Harvard. Uh, so it's a very, it's still a very, very rarefied in terms of its uh, congressional leadership and really hasn't uh, yet reached out uh, to, to all the different parts of America. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about this difference between uh, rural and urban areas, the south and, and the coast. Um, um, what can be done to win the hearts of people uh, living in uh, in rural areas and uh, and more in the south, any well, any thoughts on that? You have to realize I'm not a strategist. I just, mm -hmm. I just analyze things that, you know, after after they happen. Uh, I I spent uh, seven years as a professional revolutionary and 
about 1976, I figured I was no good at it because uh, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> we the country had become more conservative rather than uh, uh, more revolutionary while I was doing it. So, I, I again, I don't I I don't have any formula for it, but. Mm -hmm. The, the uh, obvious problem we have in America is the culture clash. And uh, the, bo bo both sides have to be able to compromise. But in terms of my side, I, you know, I think that, that on social issues, the people are just going to have to recognize that they're not going to be able to get their way. I, we, we had this in the, in the 60s, too, especially in the late 60s, where in the absence of a kind of comprehensive leadership, each of the different groups that represented, let's say, women, blacks, abortion, what, what have you, would go to the absolute extreme. And we have something like that happening in the United States among the, uh, the left. That, that happened with the protests against police brutality, where you had groups say defund the police, but you had some groups actually talking about abolishing the police. Which, <laughs> It makes me cough even to think about it. <laughs> because again, that's a kind of a demand that, except if you're a kind of Leninist and think, well, you know, the police are the arm of the capitalist state, so we'd be better off without them. And let's say you have this kind of crazy abstract reasoning. People, you know, yeah. fear for their public safety. Indeed. And uh, so I'd say that's the the most important thing about bringing the country together is on cultural issues, the left is going to have to learn yeah. to, to compromise and to learn to modulate its message and to focus more on the things that, that uh, we uh, uh, in the country hold in common, support for Social Security, Medicare, a good sure. in health insurance system, things like that. So that's the that would be my main message. And like perhaps focusing more on uh, economic issues, on improving the economy rather than on, on the cultural wars. I would say yes, that's, mm -hmm. that would be my that uh -huh. would be my recipe. But no, you know, they're, they're not necessarily going to listen to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it seems that um, in such a polarized society, not only in the United States, also in, in Europe, it seems very difficult to reach unity, to reach compromise, consensus. Um, um, so that's why it's also difficult, yeah, on both sides, very difficult, I right. think. To... I've been, I was... I've been uh, pleasantly surprised by uh, the Labour Party after Corbyn. And leave mm -hmm. aside the whole question about suspending him and the anti-Semitism thing. But I think that Keir Starmer really does understand that they have to, he has to bring both back, both back the, those old labor constituencies uh -huh. that the, the party lost. Mm -hmm. And that there's nothing wrong with being patriotic and national, whatever. And mm -hmm. uh, the, the, his policy director is somebody who understands that. So I think... Uh, uh, I was too hard on them in the uh, in, in my book on on uh, socialism because I didn't think that he he would uh, understand that because he'd been the uh, the leader in the of the Remain forces and uh, he'd been the person who proposed this people's vote on Brexit. I hope I'm not getting too far off the beaten track here, mm -hmm. but but that was part of what killed them in the election in 2019 because you know you you had the leadership divided on what they would actually do if there was was such a vote um so nobody really understood where the labor party uh, stand stood in that election yeah and one of the first things he did was he said well we have to accept brexit it's a fact and we have to make the best of it and you know again has come out with programs and proposals that make sense so so uh, that would be the kind of approach in, in America that I would like to see the left take. Mm -hmm. I'm also thinking about the role of the working class or the so-called white working class in the United States in the election, because I think there's this, this myth, or at least an exaggeration, arguing that um, the working class, both in the United States and Europe, votes, the industrial manual working class votes for... Um, uh, right or far right um, populist and authoritarian uh, parties. And I think it's been split, actually. Well, it is split. And 
uh, in the United States, a, a huge part of the problem is the decline of the labor movement. Mm -hmm. In the 50s, about, you know, a third of all uh, families were union families in the United States. Um, yeah. By now, pr private industry is about six or seven percent, really low. And uh, public, if you include public workers, it's about 10 percent. So um, that, that was a, an enormously important factor in focusing a whole part of the electorate on e economic issues and mm -hmm. staying away from divisions on like whether you should own guns and all, all these kind of things that have split the country apart. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, again, I, I agree with you that it's a problem in, uh, in, in Europe as well. But in the United States, I mean, the key thing I would look at again is the, is the decline of the labor movement. Well, yeah. one of the things I had hoped that Biden would be able to do mm -hmm. is change our labor laws, but uh, he, he's not gonna be able to get it through the uh, uh, Congress, through the Senate. What he can do is he can do uh, executive action. He can appoint a secretary of labor who is, uh, who is more congenial to the labor movement. He can again, do things in terms of agency. So, so he can do that, but uh, mm. that's a key part, I think, again, in bringing these different parts of the country together. I think you also mentioned in your article that he could do something to reinvigorate, to help to reinvigorate the trade unions, actually, um, specifically. Well, yes, that's what I was talking about. I mean, mm -hmm. the, yeah. in, in the United States, when you bargain collectively, it's overseen by the National Labor Relations Board. Uh, Trump, ha again, has put anti-union people on it. So if, a, if let's say, a company uh, has a union drive, the employers can fire the union organizers and not risk uh, being uh, uh, ruled, that ruled illegal by the National Labor Relations Board. That mm -hmm. wouldn't happen under a Democrat. So he can do that. He can change things like mm -hmm. that. He can also have uh, government contracts uh, include some kind of provision for unions. So yeah, that's good. But he's not going to get us back to 33%. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and what about the role of black women specifically? Because as uh, it seems that they voted massively for Joe Biden. It's the the ethnic group um, and the gender that voted more uh, for Joe Biden or against Trump. And a friend of mine argues that um, black women have saved the world's ass. Um, uh -huh. What do you think? <laughs> well, uh, you know, a few things that he, historically, uh, it, beginning in, with the New Deal in the 30s, um, black Americans who, who then could vote started moving toward the Democratic Party because before mm -hmm. that, the Democrats were associated with the party of slavery. And that sh shift began. And then after the Civil Rights uh, Act in, in the 60s under Lyndon Johnson, you, you, you begin to get 80, 90 percent of the black vote. And that still uh, exists. So, you know, that's that's one very important factor. Yeah. Um, in, ter in terms of black women in particular, if you look at, at the women's vote, it also uh, shifted against uh, Trump. And, you know, for, again, for, for obvious reasons, the kind of char character he is, um, is very offensive to a lot of women. Um, mm -hmm. You know, just personally, when, when Trump won, I was surprised that the women I know took it much harder than the men, um, including myself. I, mean, I, mm -hmm. I think, well, you know, the guy is just, you know, what the hell? I mean, he'll change and stuff. He won't be. But uh, he really, in some sense, has been seeing it as a kind of monster. So there's been a flight of women in general away from uh, Trump and the Republican Party. And it's reflected in the white suburbs or whatever. It's not just black women. But but again, if you add those two factors, historic uh, allegiance to the Democratic Party among among black Americans, plus uh, uh, women being particularly offended by um, Trump, then you get the, the importance of the black women voting. And then there's the Latino vote, which is not homogeneous. Um, there are different cultures from different countries and from Latin America in the United States. Right. But from the outside, sometimes it seems surprising that they uh, that so many, I think, 
20, 30 percent, 30 percent voted for um, for Trump. And I think you, you can um, you explain that it has to do more with cultural issues than with uh, with cultural issues, essentially. Yeah. Well, look, the, again, the, the uh, American political consultants and and uh, pundits or pollsters have this thing about people of color in the United States There's non-white people, but it's total nonsense because there's an incredible array of different nationalities and cultures that make up the country, and many of whom are very different. For instance, uh, in Orange County, outside of Los Angeles, um, Republicans won two votes that were uh, in heavily Vietnamese districts. Mm -hmm. Vietnamese uh, Americans used to be Republican. They went Democratic in 2018. They switch back, so it's not a an again an automatic. Uh, yeah. Um, Florida, emigres uh, and their children from Cuba, Venezuela, and Colombia, uh, all the Cuban socialism and and Venezuelan socialism yeah. big issue. Trump uh, was very outspoken. Uh, he's gone as far as he can to break relations with Cuba. Uh, alternative government in uh, Venezuela. So that was an enormous factor in their voting uh, for Trump. Mm -hmm. uh, Southwest, uh, South, uh, again, is, is a little different. Um, on one hand, there is a cultural issue. About, uh, the Latinos there tend to be socially conservative, very religious, Catholics and mm -hmm. evangelicals. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Leery of abortion rights, um, anything like this transgender, what, what have you. And, and if a candidate, if a Democratic candidate runs strongly on those issues, they might not vote for him. If the candidate emphasizes something else, economics, they m might vote. So that's a, that's a factor. And the final thing is that um, Hispanics, I don't think are like, they don't have the same kind of historic ties to the Democratic Party that uh, black Americans do or that Jewish Americans do. Mm -hmm. uh, they are in some ways more similar to the Irish, the Italians, uh, Germans, these immigrants who come to the United States and sometimes as they make good, as they have small businesses, as they be go into management, uh, they start to think, well, I don't want my taxes to go up. I don't want to do all this spending. So maybe I'm better off with the Republicans. And I think that's another factor in the uh, in in the uh, Hispanic vote uh, going to the uh, going to, to Trump. We also see that uh, um, um, the voting patterns are complex in terms of um, the level of education. Sometimes there's also this myth or exaggeration of saying that the low, the poorly educated or the lower educated people vote for Trump. But we see that it's again split. Highly educated have voted 50% for Biden, 50% for um, for Trump, and the less educated, same thing. Basically. Well, you know, that's again that that's again a fiction of pollsters. Mm -hmm. uh, if you mm -hmm. look at, let's say, if you look yeah. at people with postgraduate education, that there you're going to get mostly into professionals. You're going to get get into people who are technicians. Uh, so again, social workers, teachers, nurses, doctors, architects, mm -hmm. uh, ranging from a lower level to a higher level, they go heavily for the Democrats. I think it was 63 uh, percent. Mm -hmm. If you look at people who have four year college degrees and no more, that's again, that tends to be a 50 50 or or in many mm -hmm. areas pro Republican. And those are people. Who are like who are more likely to be in sales, white collar stuff, where profit is the a very important uh, consi uh -huh. consideration, yeah. and again they'd be more worried about taxes and spending than uh, let's say than a school teacher or a nurse are. So uh, yeah. I, again, I think you have to break, you have to s split up those particular uh, categories. E even when you again when you're thinking of these different so-called minorities. Some minorities, like some A Asian immigrants, Ch mm -hmm. Chinese Americans, people come from Taiwan, uh, they now have a higher average income than anybody, any other group in America. Uh -huh. They become professionals, but they also 
end up a lot of them vote, vote Democrat. Others, other groups become bi small business, et cetera, more likely Republicans. So mm -hmm. e again, it's each nationality has its economic and its social culture. Mm -hmm. and you have to evaluate it on that basis and campaign on that basis. Uh, and these uh, people who talk about, you know, majority minorities or people of color are, are, are really using the kind of misleading generalizations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Always better to be um, concrete in such a complex uh, and diverse country, especially. And I'm thinking about this term that you've used, the um, emerging democratic um, uh, majority. Yeah. Um, right. uh, what do you mean? Did it happen this time? Well, it happened w when we talked about it. I mean, uh, Rui Tashir and I wrote a book in 2002, mm -hmm. and we said by the end of the decade that uh, Democrats would have achieved a majority, but it wouldn't be a, the kind of super majority that Franklin Roosevelt had. So, you know, mm -hmm. that did happen. What we didn't anticipate was that uh, large parts of the white working class would end up Align with the uh, uh, Republicans, which started to happen in 2010. Mm -hmm. uh, so now we have a situation in the country really of a kind of st uh, standoff between the two parties where they alternate in power. Uh, and we'll, we'll have to see what happens in 2022 in our next elections, but I would not be shocked if the Republicans make a comeback in those elections. Mm -hmm. There's also been a, a similar debate in Spain and in Europe on whether to focus more on cultural issues or economic aspects. Um, I think that they have to be combined in a way. Yeah? Um, um, but especially the problem I see is that um, social democratic parties, labor parties, the democratic party in the United States essentially abandon the, the working class, the, the industrial working class, um, uh, abandon the class struggle and um, accepting neoliberalism, yeah, and the the so-called losers of globalization have reacted against that, and sometimes they move um, uh, towards uh, right-wing positions or even far-right-wing uh, positions. Not always. Some of them have gone to the right and then come back to the left, or have also remained um, on the left. Um, well, uh, again, we don't have a Labour Party in the United States. Mm -hmm. We have a Democratic Party, which is heterogeneous and has always had uh, business as well as uh, a labor in it. So uh, in a sense, they've never been, uh, they've never been meshed, but uh, it's absolutely true that on several key issues beginning in the uh, 80s and 90s, the Democrats did abandon uh, the cause of industrial workers. And, uh, you know, I'm particularly thinking of the on trade issues on the uh, North American Free Trade Agreement. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm and on the uh, way that we dealt with China coming into the World Trade Organization. Uh, we, we put a lot of our industries at peril, and as a result, somebody like Trump was able to come up in 2016 and win a lot of uh, votes on that, uh, uh, on those kind of issues. I used to, when I gave talks about the election after that, I used to always ask people, well, you know, there were all these states that lost a lot of uh, industrial jobs during the uh, Great Recession. And what do you think uh, was first? And they usually get, you know, more Michigan. But what was second? North Carolina, which Trump mm -hmm. won. The furniture industry all moved to Mexico. Mm -hmm. So again, uh, yeah, the Democrats took their eye off the ball on that. Mm -hmm. I think they also took their eye off the ball on immigration. Uh, Democrats, again, labor movement, always uh, strong on having a labor policy on immigration that would protect workers in such a way there wouldn't be surpluses. There wouldn't mm -hmm. be situation where you couldn't organize workers because there were always workers banging on the door who wanted to get in. And uh, the, the labor movement ended up accepting uh, a policy which... Uh, Led in millions and millions of unskilled workers who competed. It's actually with a lot of the black workers who, after our civil rights acts, were finally able to uh, get uh, get employment without suffering from discrimination. But now they were faced with enormous kinds of competition uh, from, mm -hmm. particularly from the south uh, south of the border. So uh, on both uh, on both the issues of trade and immigration. Uh, 
the Democrats took their eye off and, um, you know, they paid the price in 2016 because mm -hmm. those were the two big economic issues that uh, Trump focused on. Mm -hmm. um, I remember when you visited uh, Spain, um, uh, we had an emerging uh, party, which is Podemos, and it was essentially a populist party. And now it's part of government with the Socialist Party, um, uh, the vice president right. um, and three ministers belong to um, to Podemos, the Socialist Party is a social democratic party. Yeah, um, I don't know if you have any thoughts about um, about this, about Spain and, uh, and no, the relative success. Gotta, Sorry, I, I want to hear what you think. I don't. I didn't. I wouldn't pretend to know about it. Yeah, I, it's it sounds again li uh, like a situation of co-optation. Mm -hmm. But I, yeah. again, you would know better than I would. Well, in my view, it's been uh, very difficult. Podemos has been attacked by um, many media outlets, by uh, political parties. They have been uh, sued like seven times. They have been uh, they have gone to the judges and uh, they are clean seven times at least. Um, and they finally made it in spite of all this demonization. And of course, they've made many mistakes indeed. Um, uh, sometimes um, they uh, well, they've made many mistakes, but it's also true that um, uh, if this pandemic um, had been managed by other parties, probably the result would have been worse in terms of protecting the most uh, vulnerable people. Yeah, For right. example, the uh, unemployment subsidies, um, uh, economic support, and Spain is a relatively poor country compared to to the United States. So even in uh, within... Uh, and now within some margins, um, uh, things can be done in economic terms. Not only the, the cultural battle, but actually finding the money from somewhere and uh, um, uh, putting it where people uh, need it. So in that regard, there are some, uh, some interesting uh, developments, but still also many, many problems, many difficulties, many attacks and, uh, and many mistakes also. I mean, when I, when I was in Spain and uh, visiting you, uh, then the talk was of Podemos uh, d displacing the Socialist Party. Yes, the yes. Number two and even the number one party in Spain. Yes. That really hasn't happened. Uh, the, their yeah. vote seems to have uh, just uh, st stayed at, a, you know, what is, is it less than 10 percent? It's about 10. Not not impressive. I think it's 14 or um, 14, 15 percent, I think. Oh. Yeah. No, they lost. It's. Um, uh, they were also spied by um, an illegal police body. So it's been difficult and they've also made mistakes. There were three elections in a row because there was no, um, no, uh, nobody, no winner. So uh, many voters got a little bit um, disengaged and, uh, and voted for the, for the safe vote, which was voting for the Socialist Party to win. Um, uh, so yes, it's, uh, there, there was a, a very fast rise and the relative fall of um, of Podemos, and, and probably the uh, Socialist Party itself moved to the left. Yes, that could be a success of Podemos, maybe like yeah. uh, pushing the Socialist Party to to the left. Well, it was a success for Podemos to influence them, but it was again, it was that's the historic pattern of exactly. parties. They influence, exactly. but they don't don't end up ruling. Yeah, exactly. Very difficult. It's. Uh, almost impossible but we also have a, a communist minister because Podemos united with Izquierda Unida with United Left mm -hmm. and, uh, and the minister of consumption is um, a self-declared communist all his life he's been a Marxist and a communist and, uh, and he's doing some regulations for example uh, with regards to to betting activities to advertising of uh, betting casinos etc um, uh, more from the perspective of consumption than of production, <laughs> for, uh -huh. which is uh, curious for a, for a Marxist. But within the limits of the power they have and, um, and, the, and, the, uh, and the established powers, um, uh, it's uh, an interesting uh, um, uh, thing that uh, a communist is in government, yeah, is yes, a right. minister. And the, I think the best, um, the best um, minister is uh, the labor minister. She's a woman, Yolanda Diaz, and she's been doing, she's been negotiating both with, uh, with business and with workers, with the mm -hmm. trade unions. 
and found some good agreements. Um, uh, even the president of the Santander Bank praised uh, some of her policies of uh, providing money for uh, workers who are uh, who were not working during the confinement, and uh, and that was um, that was very helpful for many people. But there's a, a lot of inequality, much more poverty now in Spain, so it's not. Um, it's not what would somebody who voted for Podemos be voting for? What distinguishes it apart? Because <laughs> again, when I was there, there was a tremendous amount of corruption, and that yeah. was a big issue. They they were sort of the with with that other party. I'm going to get the pronunciation wrong. Cuidadanos. They were both. There was sort of the left wing yeah. good government and and right wing yeah. government parties. But that that's disappeared to some extent, hasn't it? Or uh, what is yeah. some people are they sort of the young socially liberal version of the left? Is that the? It's uh, now it's uh, since Podemos is not so much a populist party nowadays. People identify them with a left wing party. Yeah? yeah. So most voters are the the voters of the traditional left of uh -huh. uh, United Left, and some younger people also vote for uh, Podemos. They are. Um, um, in favor of of change, of more uh, equality, of ra of cultural and civil rights, right. etc. But it's more like during the populist uh, explosion of Podemos, there were more like um, um, ambivalent voters who turned uh, towards Podemos, or even formerly right wing voters mm -hmm. who voted for uh, Podemos, or socialist voters. Also, now it's more like the traditional strong left. Yeah. Um, okay. Yes. So that's like they have a ceiling. They cannot. It's very okay. difficult for them to grow uh, much more now. I think. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. But in but, Europe, they can still exist. In the United States, that couldn't happen because yeah. we mm -hmm. really do have a two-party system, and that's. Yeah. If we had a multi-party system, I would say something differently about the mm -hmm. you know fate of the the left wing in the Democratic Party over the mm -hmm. next two or four years because it would be a separate organization and you'd need to get them to as part of coalitions, but um, yeah. they become dispersed yes. In yes, and have to re, re, reconnect uh, every two years. Well, you've been using this term of uh, cooptation, um, but it's always like dialectical because when um, a left wing or or a populist political party is co-opted. That party is um, not a, not annulled, but loses. It's is weakened. Yeah, the populist or left wing party. But at the same time, like with uh, Roosevelt, the populist um, movement was able to push very progressive reforms, which are helpful for the population. And that in the end is um, right. is a, is partly successful. Yeah, right. Yui Long was the share the wealth and he had these just incredibly ridiculous uh, plans for giving uh, every family and this is 1930s ten thousand mm -hmm. dollars each or something something that was just inconceivable then but nonetheless mobilized people and roosevelt yeah. and the democrats got worried about him running for president and that was a lot of the reason why we had this second new deal in 1935 with social security graduated income tax all these things i mean it was the the single greatest uh, year for uh, progressive legislation in America. And what about the Green New Deal? Well, the Green New Deal, again, uh, I, I think it lost the Democrats uh, some some uh, votes in uh, areas where uh, the workers are dependent in some ways on fossil fuels. Um, we'll, we'll have to see what happens. I'm I, I I am not enthusiastic about these groups like Extinction Rebellion that want to uh, end all uh, carbon emissions by 2025 or something, you know, that would get all the cars off the road and people, everybody would have to change their heaters. I think they scare people. Uh, they remind me in some way of the kind of fears we had in the 1950s of um, nuclear war. Mm -hmm. uh, it, so I, I think that that kind of scare talk um, worries a lot of people and is not necessarily induce uh, uh, popular majorities on behalf of something like the Green New Deal. But again, if Biden Biden is going to do a lot of things on re renewable energy, the Democrats will have a Department of Energy and they will spend a lot. And so they will do 
positive things to encourage that. It just might not be called, uh, again, the Green New Deal, and its aims won't, won't, may not be as grandiose as some of the most extreme groups uh, who champion that cause. Mm -hmm. um, um, there's an idea that uh, you've mentioned in your previous response and uh, at the beginning of the conversation, which is sometimes or very often political parties and uh, populist uh, parties, they uh, don't deliver what they promise. And this is also when they are punished in, um, in, uh, in, uh, in elections. And I'm thinking, for example, Podemos promised a universal income, um, um, uh, oh, yeah. a universal basic income. Right. And now they are doing something much more moderate because there's no money. So yeah. sometimes when you promise so much and then you don't deliver, um, a part of the population gets angry at you. Right. And that happened in Greece when they promised to defy the uh, Troika and then didn't. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, the country had to endure more and more austerity. So, yeah. yes, absolutely. And it happened to Trump as well. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, John, my last question is what can we expect uh, in the future? For, in the United States? In the United States. I, I think uh, we, we will have a, a gridlock in the country the way we had under Obama, where the two parties are just at, at uh, sword's point with each other. But that's better than we had uh, under uh, Trump. Well, we really had a, a corrupt guy who was out for his own uh, power and had no sense of what the nation, the national interest was, in spite of all this nonsense about America first. I think uh, Biden will again try to bring people together. I just think that it's a very, very hard thing. And uh, he, w we don't know yet whether uh, this 77-year-old uh, guy is, is, is even up to it. I don't, yeah. I don't n nobody knows. I mean, the advantage of, of Biden, again, is that, that he does have a lot of experience. The last, uh, the, his predecessors, starting with Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, Obama, and Trump came into office without that kind of experience and, and made mistakes in foreign policy right away, for instance. They didn't, George W. Bush, obviously. I mean, they didn't, they, they just didn't know what they were doing. Uh, the, peop, the last person who did was George H.W. Bush, the, the dad, uh, in 1988. Uh, he'd been head of the CIA, vice president. That's the kind of thing that Biden brings to the office, and that's really good. Uh, I, I just don't know whether he has the energy, whether he has the public presence uh, to bring, bring the country together. He's not that uh, effective again. He doesn't have Obama or Clinton or Ronald Reagan's uh, theatrical skills, public skills, uh, mm -hmm. where in a case, if the Congress were dis deadlocked, he could go before the country and win, the, win over the public. So mm -hmm. again, I'm looking at a... I'm looking at a difficult situation that we will not probably get out of for four or eight years, but hopefully we'll have a vaccine. So that's mm -hmm. the very important. Yes, yes, that's yes. that's as far as Americans and you know everybody else in the world. That's yes. at present the key consideration. Yes. And under under Biden, we won't have to worry that it'll you know that it'll contracts will go to Biden's friends or that only states that voted him will get uh, vaccines. And it was exactly the kind of thing that's really scared people about Trump. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, people need hope, but uh, in, at least in the midterm and the long term, the prospects are quite grim. But I was wondering if um, if you still hold uh, some um, optimism, some hope with regards to building some form of post-capitalist society in the next 50 years, 170 years. I know it's uh, far away, but... Uh... We, we keep having these crises, and I expected each, I expected with Obama that he would be able to uh, pull the country together and to uh, do these very ambitious programs uh, because it's only when we have crises in the United States that people... Uh, for the time being, leave aside their skepticism about big government. This is something we have in the United States mm -hmm. that a lot of countries in Europe do not have. Some of it, some of it in, yeah. in uh, the UK, but mm -hmm. uh, 
it's inbred in the United States. So we can seem to only be able to do big things at moments when there are big crises. And I had hoped for the pandemic recession, uh, as bad as it is, to bring that about. But again, the the fact that we're going to have a Republican Senate is very discouraging for me. Yeah. Uh, and so really, really what I, I have to say to you, which is not not very optimistic, is we're going to might have to wait for the next crisis. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. Yes, yes. Uh, well, we'll see. We'll see what happens, John. Many, many thanks for uh, this very pleasant conversation. Um, we plan to have a, to have a shorter uh, talk, but it was so nice that we. Um, oh. I just kept uh, asking you more and more questions, um, uh, but I'm gonna turn off the uh, the video now.